Hello and welcome to our latest Insider interview. Today in the studio, I have with me James Thompson, Fund Manager of the Rathbone Global Opportunities Fund. James, great to see you today. Thank you for having me, Carl. So James, you've been managing the fund for over 20 years now. What are the key lessons that you've learned over that period? I think one of the greatest enemies in this business is actually overconfidence. I, I think it's important to have a little bit of insecurity, doubt, and um, maybe even a touch of uh, imposter syndrome when you're doing uh, videos, for instance. I think all of those actually can be very useful as long as they don't overwhelm you, because what it does is it actually creates the, the oxygen uh, to change your mind and not believe that you're always right and, and that the market is wrong. I think some of the other things I've learned is that particularly when it comes to investing in growth stocks, expensive doesn't always mean overvalued. And a lot of uh, pure valuation driven investors miss some of the best investments in the market because optically the valuation looks too rich. And there can be a very good reason for that. It's because the estimates are wrong. Look at Nvidia, for example. People said they refused to invest in NVIDIA because it was on a PE of 70 times earnings, which admittedly looks expensive, but actually the earnings were wrong. It's now on a PE below 30 because analysts and investors had underestimated the earnings potential of this growth of this business. So I think um, believing that valuation is a science, I think can be, can be dangerous. I think it's much more of an art. And then combining that with uh, patience uh, and the healing power of time, I actually think that that is an important um, ingredient in, 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 in a, in a multi-decade career. And then I think the, the final thing I've learned is that um, many investors are very quick to declare victory. They are very keen to sell their winners uh, and declare victory and move on to the next idea and actually from looking at my contributors to performance over 20 years. It is those long-term investments that we have run that have made the greatest contribution to performance. And so running those winners, not declaring victory too early actually can be a, a great driver of success over the long term. And over that 20 year period, what would you pick out as being your best and your worst investments? Yes, I sort of feel like we're on the therapist sofa here. My worst investments, yeah, they ne they're never far from, from my mind. And actually, I think some of the scars from your worst investments can be very useful. So you don't try and make those same mistakes twice. My, my worst investment, it goes back quite a long time now, was in 2007. I invested in an airline business that went bust on Christmas Eve. Uh, so that wasn't exactly the Christmas present that, that I was looking for. So I think we Obviously, it was a very painful moment, but you know we've 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 learned from that episode, and that type of business is now totally un unsuitable. A business where one of the main drivers of their success was outside of their control, and that was uh, eventually what what sunk them. Some of my other worst investments, I guess I would put them in the category of earlier stage, more speculative businesses that didn't really have a a deeply embedded, loyal, resilient business model. So some of those earlier stage businesses, which were, were, were ended up proving quite vulnerable and, and ended up making negative contributions to performance. But let's not dwell on totally on the negative. Uh, we've had great success over, over many years at the hands of some great businesses and great management teams running them. Some of our top performers over the last 20 years, one would be a business in the UK, Rightmove. Uh, another would be Amazon. And then the third would be Visa. All three of these companies we've owned for at least 15 years, uh, and they've all generated more than a thousand percent return. And so those sorts of positive contributors to performance tend to swamp even those worst investments that, that, that inevitably we all make over, uh, over our careers. And, and, and I think they, you know, they, they deserve their place in the portfolio and remain there to this day. So moving back to the present day, so last year, the stock market was heavily influenced by a small number of companies, and that's the US stock market and the global stock market, and those companies are the Magnificent Seven. If those companies continue to dominate in the same way they did last year, is that really dangerous for stock markets? Yes, I think that concentration of market returns, which last year was the highest ever, 
has been a source of great angst for investors and, and perhaps another reason why investors are not uh, putting their money into, into many global stock markets. In, in my eyes, it makes, it makes sense. Uh, we've now gone through two years of rising interest rates. That undoubtedly is dampening global demand. Growth is hard to find. And so when growth is hard to find, investors tend to gravitate towards the few companies that are actually providing it, which is why I, I think you're seeing you know, that concentration, that lion's share of returns coming from a fairly small number of companies. When growth is hard to find, investors gravitate towards the, the companies that are, are providing it. But you know, I think we, we shouldn't um, uh, overplay it. You know, if I look at my top performers over the last six months, I, I think actually is the, there's a broader story to tell here. And, and actually, there are um, different companies that are making a significant positive contribution. Yes, NVIDIA was at the top of the list. But we also have businesses like Costco, the warehouse club, Microsoft, which is, again, is in the Magnificent Seven, uh, Intuit, which is the, the business that owns TurboTax, how you file your tax returns in the United States, and QuickBooks, which is used for, for small businesses to do their accounting. Sintas, which is a U.S. company that does uniform rentals. ASML, a semiconductor equipment company. Broadridge, which is a back office IT services provider for financial services businesses. And Amphenol, an, an industrial business that makes connectors. So you can see from that list that actually, you know, we have a pretty broad spread of different demand drivers making a significant tr contribution to the, to the portfolio's performance. And so the idea that it's um, completely concentrated in just the small number of companies, I think might be, might be taking it a bit too far. When I last interviewed you, which was around two years ago, you mentioned that you had been increasing some exposure to US banks. Do you still have those positions? Obviously, since then, we've seen interest rates rise but also there was a mini banking crisis that plays out in the US. And I also wanted to ask you, given that interest rates now look like they've peaked and there may be some cuts this year in the US and also potentially in the UK, are you looking to reposition the portfolio to sectors and companies that may benefit from lower interest rates? Yeah, that was a mistake uh, to buy those banks. Uh, and if you'll remember last year, we had a regional bank crisis uh, in the United States, and some of the banks that I owned were caught up in that crisis. Uh, luckily, um, due to the expert network of analysts that we have around us, we were alerted to some potential problems there. Some of the flight of deposits that they were starting to see and some of the key indicators that some of these banks were starting to come out with were starting to raise red flags with some of our best and brightest analysts. So fortunately, we sold uh, our banks five months before the, the, the banking crisis and avoided pretty calamitous turn in, 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 in that area of the market. I think it highlights a problem where you shouldn't base an investment case solely around a macroeconomic forecast. I think that's one of the great dangers. And actually, when we invested in those banks, it wasn't solely on an interest rate view, but that did play a, a role in it and we thought created potentially a following wind. Uh, but I think we've learned our, our lesson there. And it's important not to make the same mistake twice uh, from, the, from, the other, from the other angle. So even though it looks like we're entering a period where rates are falling, I think it's dangerous to potentially presume the winners that will come uh, in that environment. What we have done is created a portfolio with balance. We don't want to uh, bet the outcome on a single macroeconomic development. And so we've built the portfolio that, uh, in a way that's balanced to withstand a number of different economic environments that, that these companies can, can thrive in uh, no matter what is thrown at them. So I think that's probably the, 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 the best way to position the portfolio. More recently, we certainly noticed a move from a lot of corporates from defense to offense. You know, a lot of budgets were very uh, tight last year, and we're now starting to see the purse strings being loosened. And so we think it's right also to, to pivot away from, from defense into some more offense as well as we go into this year in what has been probably one of the most hated bull markets uh, in history. We think there's, there, there are opportunities for a, a more offensive position, some more um, you know, exciting growth names to go into the portfolio in the months ahead. 
So you no longer have exposure to US banks. So where have you been finding opportunities? What have been your newest purchases for the fund? Yes, we've, um, over the last six months, put some new holdings into the portfolio. Yes, we have made a number of um, uh, purchases over the last six months into, into the portfolio. A variety of businesses in different sectors with different uh, demand drivers. Uh, the first one would be Novo Nordisk, uh, which is the Danish uh, pharmaceutical company, uh, which has a real uh, pedigree in uh, the diabetes franchise. You have seen Novo Nordisk in the headlines over the last year or two with their miracle drugs, Ozempic and Wegovi, which cause uh, some pretty rapid weight loss uh, and improvements in all sorts of other related diseases that come from obesity and diabetes. And so I must credit my mother, actually, with pointing me out to this investment opportunity. I wish I'd listened to her sooner, actually. And she went on Ozempic about two years ago and has lost about 50 pounds. As a result of it, no longer diabetic and has, has um, a whole new positive outlook on life um, a, a, as well as the, all of the health benefits that, that's, that are coming through. So I think it shows that you should always listen to your mother, uh, even in the investment business. Uh, another company that we have been buying recently is Walmart, the, the supermarket and uh, 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 warehouse club, uh, uh, one of the largest retailers in the world. I think this shows the scale advantages that a, a retailer like Walmart can bring to the, to the party. We're in a much more difficult environment for consumer spending. Consumer spending is not coming in the linear way that it used to historically. It tends to be much more seasonally based now. And so you need a company with the scale uh, and the buying power in, in order to navigate a, an environment which isn't as uh, close to trend uh, throughout the year. So we've been buying Walmart. And then we bought another U.S. company called Monster, uh, which makes energy drinks. You know, we're all aware of this health and wellness kick that the, we're going through globally, um, but not everybody's on board. I think um, there's a part of the population who really wants some of these energy drinks, high caffeine, high levels of sugar, keep them going throughout the day. Uh, and I think that's a, a category that actually is growing very quickly despite some of those trends that might seem to be a headwind. So all three of those companies, I think, bring uh, you know, interesting and different demand drivers, some, sometimes resiliency in our weatherproof bucket, but then more pro-growth uh, parts of the portfolio as well. Um, companies that are innovating, shaking up their industry and growing quickly. The funds has around 6% in the UK. You've mentioned one of those holdings is right move. Is it an area you've been looking at a bit more closely, given how cheap the valuations are? particularly for the mid and small cap parts of the market? Yes, the UK certainly does look cheap, but you know, uh, cheapness has never been a great guide to future performance. So for me, it has to be the quality of the business that's the primary driver of, of putting a UK company into the, into the fund. And it's very competitive when you're uh, competing with markets with such innovation like the US. But yes, in fact, we are on the cusp of adding a new name into the UK part of the portfolio. So that potentially could take our, our weighting higher over the coming months. You have to look at the, 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 the types of companies in the UK market. If you're looking at the FTSE 100, they tend to be more defensive types of companies in sectors like banks and commodities and pharmaceuticals and healthcare. I think if you're looking for growth companies, you probably have to go down the market cap spectrum into the FTSE 250. For a fund like mine, actually, it's hard to invest in those sorts of companies because of the position size that we need to, to build. But at the top end of that, um, of that FTSE 250, there, there is some interesting potential ideas that can go in. So um, yes, I think it's, it's back on the menu again. Names that we have in the UK would be uh, Rightmove, Next. Compass Group, which is the catering business, uh, and Howden Joinery, which is the kitchen maker. So I think we've got an interesting, uh, interesting spread of companies there, but potentially more to come uh, watch the space. And finally, James, do you have skin in the game? Yes, I certainly do, and have for many years. Rathbone Global Opportunities is my largest uh, personal investment by a country mile, and it's also my daughter's largest uh, personal investment. So that certainly sharpens my focus. James, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Carl. So that's it for our latest Insider interview episode. Hope you've enjoyed it. You can let us know what you think. You can comment. And please do hit that like button and subscribe. And hopefully I'll see you again next time. <laughs>